right, so let's get started here. So what we're gonna talk about today is anesthesia, primarily in small animals, so dogs and cats. Um, I do wanna caveat, I am not an anesthesiologist, uh, but I'm, I'll be happy to go through our protocols and kind of what we use day in, day out. Uh, and we'll also talk about some field anesthesia techniques uh, based on um, Dr. Dixon, Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Page, and some personal experience as well. So first thing is just, you know, kind of getting a broad spectrum of what we're, what we're talking about here. So uh, big picture, we're going to go over uh, pre-medications, induction uh, methods and drugs, how we maintain them under anesthesia. Um, as far as monitoring, you know, the three most important things, in my opinion, it's going to be keeping up with their temperature, their uh, pulse, and their respiration. So their heart rate and respiration rates. Um, and, and the nice thing about the TPR is that you don't have to have any kind of special mach machinery to do this. Um, you know, a lot of times with these fancy machines, you know, you, you might get a false reading anyway. So it's always good to be able to keep up with these three and maintain um, an accurate uh, assessment of those three during every process. Uh, but we do use machines. Uh, so we're, we're gonna keep up with ECG, pulse ox, blood pressure, catmograph. I'm not going to have enough time to go over each um, individual subset there, but just uh, like I said, it's really important that you uh, keep up with the TPR uh, primarily. Uh, and I'm briefly going to go over just a few of the most common complications that we see uh, under anesthesia. And like I said, we'll talk about some field anesthesia. So just to start with, just to kind of get a general understanding, there's four main stages of anesthesia. The first stage is when you're going to have uh, start to get a reduction of pain. Uh, so you're going to start getting some pain control. You'll have an analgesia phase. The next one is the one that we really want to avoid. It's the um, excitement stage. And so we're going to use different types of medicines to kind of, um, you know, put them in stage one. And then we kind of want to skip or go through stage two pretty quickly to get into the surgical anesthesia. And then the one we don't want to go into is stage four. Uh, because that's when you're starting to have too much of an effect on the heart and the lungs uh, to the point of where they can start to fail. Uh, and that's when we get in really critical uh, place. So the idea is we want to stay in that stage three of anesthesia. So the way that we're going to do that, the first step is to do pre-medications or what I'm going to refer to as pre-meds. Um, so uh, the, the main reason that we're going to be using those is just to kind of help um, smooth out the induction and the recovery and so what it's going to do is provide some relaxation you know we have a lot of patients you know as they're coming in they're going to have a release of catecholamines and adrenaline as they're coming in uh, to a new to your clinic or to your uh, workspace and so it's just going to help relax them give them a little bit of mild sedation and, and some of the drugs will even provide some chemical restraint the nice thing is it's going to decrease the amount of drugs uh, requirements of the other drugs that we're going to have to use. And by decreasing the amount of drugs that we're using, we're also going to decrease the um, chances of adverse reactions just because we don't have as much going through their system. So the first class I want to talk about is one that we use quite often is the opioids. Uh, and butorphanol has been around for a while. It's, it's used quite regular in the states and so uh, the nice thing about it is you can give it sub q you can give it im or iv um, and it works really well for uh, young young pups or really old pups uh, respiratory cases in particular so if you got uh, a cat that's coming into your clinic and they're open mouth breathing and they're really struggling and it's probably asthma or even congestive heart failure something along those lines you can go ahead and give them a little dose of butorphanol just to kind of take the edge off. Um, but as far as pre-med, it works really well, like I said, for neonates and geriatrics because it is pretty short acting. Um, but the one caveat I would say is that it is pretty poor pain control. So I don't really rely on this one if I have something really painful like a fracture, uh, a large uh, dog fight wounds, excuse me, uh, or severe trauma. I like this one more for, you know, pre-med before going into a dental cleaning, um, or maybe we have a small um, laceration, or maybe we just need to sedate to get some good x-rays. 
I think it's important to know that this is a kappa agonist and a mu antagonist. And the reason that's important is because it is an antagonist at the mu opioid site, it will actually block or partially reverse the effects of a mu agonist. So you don't want to mix this one with um, like a morphine or hydromorphone, which I'll cover here. So the two um, full mu opioids we use the most commonly are going to be morphine and um, hydromorphone. Uh, these provide really good pain control, uh, much better than butorphanol, some of the best pain control. Um, side effects that we typically see is going to be, you know, you can see a lot of panting. Uh, most of the time they're going to vomit. If you give it IM or sub-Q, they're going to vomit, which, you know, a lot of times is not a bad thing before you're about to induce them and put a tube in because you can empty out their stomach. Uh, we do a fast. I like to do at least like a, a four to 12 hour fasting but sometimes owners forget or they they don't really account like treats as being really food so they might give them some treats that morning so kind of it actually works to our benefit sometimes where they'll throw up any food uh, one small thing you know i do like to watch out for is like if you know it's a mast cell tumor um, be careful with the morphine because it can cause a histamine release which can cause these mast cell tumors to kind of proliferate and they can kind of have like a little bit of a uh, histamine response where they can develop hives or the tumor you're about to take off can can get quite large so if you are gonna if you are having to use it i would recommend doing some benadryl or diphenhydramine along with that the nice thing about morphine is that you there is a reversal in naloxone so you can use that to reverse it or like i said if you're if you don't have naloxone and you do have some butorphanol you can give butorphanol to kind of reverse the effects of it and in my mind hydromorphone works pretty much the same way. It's a little bit more potent and it's a little faster acting. So um, we don't give quite as much of it, but um, as far as clinically, they, they work pretty similar and have the same um, side effects. And typically we're gonna be able to reverse it the same way. Last one I'm gonna talk about is buprenorphine. And buprenorphine is also a few a mu agonist um, opioid, uh, but this one is interesting because it, it binds really tightly to the receptors, and that's important to know because uh, because it binds so tightly, we can have a much longer effect. It also will kind of prevent other mu agonists from working because it it binds so tightly to the receptors. So you don't want to mix this one with other opioids. Um, you can reverse it with naloxone, but sometimes you may have to repeat the dose again just because it binds so tightly. Um, buprenorphine works really well because we don't tend to have as much side effects. You know, you get sedation, but you don't typically see vomiting that often or hypersalivation. It is kind of expensive for bigger dogs, so a lot of times it, we use it for cats because it's a really effective pain medicine that um, works well, low side effects, relatively safe so it, it works really well for for small cats or for cats and small dogs sorry so um the other pre-med that we're going to talk about uh, or another one is alpha 2 agonist and uh, this one causes um, sedation it does provide pain control which is really nice and it reduces um, anxiety and so um when you combine this with ketamine you get injectable um anesthesia and it works well with a lot of other pre-meds. Uh, important things to know about it is they do cause cardiac and respiratory depression, especially uh, you can get a lot of um, bradycardia or slow heart rate. So that's something to be uh, keeping an eye on. A lot of times right off the bat, you're gonna get hypertension, but then that's followed by a hypotension. And so if you're routinely putting in IV catheters, it can uh, make it a little bit more difficult to place the catheter once it takes effect just because the blood pressure peripherally is pretty low. Uh, the most common one used um, probably around the world and uh, in particular in India is probably xylazine. Uh, it's a great medicine that's been around for a long time. You can use it in a lot of different animals. Um, sometimes we'll use it just to induce vomiting in cats uh, because you know, if they get into some kind of a plant or some kind of toxin, 
you can give them a dose of, of xylazine. A lot of times they'll vomit from that. Um, you do see a lot of hypersalivation. The other nice thing about xylazine is it does have a reversal agent, uh, yohimbine. Um, with the yohimbine, you can get muscle tremor, salivation, and a little bit of a excitement. So if you got a dog that's really down and out and needs to be reversed, just be aware, once you give that reversal, they can pop up pretty quick and be a little bit loopy. So just make sure your recovery area, uh, you're ready for that. Make sure you don't get bit or anything because a dog might accidentally um, do that. One that's a little bit newer drug, um, but it's been used a lot more widely in the States now is dexmedetomidine. Um, it's much more potent than xylazine. And so we actually dose it primarily based on micrograms and not milligrams per kilogram. So you're doing five to 10 micrograms per kilogram. Uh, it's a really good drug because it's, you can give it sub-Q, IM or IV. Uh, we primarily are gonna use it in more of the healthy dogs and cats because of the effects that it has on the heart and respiratory system. Initially, um, you know, again, we're gonna get the hypertension and the hypotension. Uh, one thing to remember though, is if you're using, let's say you're using dexmedetomidine with a butorphanol and you make a loud noise, they can, they may seem like they're completely asleep and then they can pop up really quickly. So I usually like to, if we're just sedating them with this, I like to put something over their eyes or maybe even some cotton balls in their ear to decrease the sound effects. Um, which if you're about to put a catheter in and induce them, it's not as big of a deal. But if you're using it just as a sedation protocol for, like I said, for some kind of mild um, x-rays or nail trimming or something they just need some sedation for, just be aware of that. Uh, you can get profound bradycardia in these. Like I said, um, it's not uncommon to see heart rates in the 50s and 60s. And I'm actually pretty happy when I'm seeing that. When I don't like seeing it, it was when we get into the low 40s or the 30s, which does happen um, from time to time. When I see that, typically what I'm gonna do is, um, you can do like a partial, you can give atropine, but I don't routinely like to do that to increase the heart rate because basically you're causing the heart to decrease because of the alpha-2 agonist that you're giving, and then you're asking it to increase back up with the atropine. It's more common to do that with xylazine, with, but with dexmedetomidine, I typically do like maybe a half reversal. So let's say you gave 0.1 mLs of the dexmedetomidine, then I might do 0 0.05 mLs of the adipamazole. Give, give that IM and give that about 10 or 15 minutes. If the bradycardia hasn't improved, then you can give another half reversal. If it still doesn't improve, then that's typically when I might do the atropine at that point. Uh, but I don't routinely give that, you know, just as a, a general protocol with the uh, DEX. So the next class is the benzodiazepines. And uh, these are GABA agonists. And so they work really well for any dog that has a history of seizures that you're going to have to put under anesthesia. Um, you get good muscle relaxation, uh, but I don't like to use these by themselves because you can get euphoria. And I was talking about the four stages. This one will put you in that stage two pretty quickly. And so I don't like to do them by themselves because they'll get really euphoric. The nice thing, like I said, is it does, it does have minimal uh, activity on the cardiovascular system. So we don't worry as much if there's some heart disease present. And so it's really good, like I said, for some of our older patients, uh, patients with a history of seizures, uh, or other ongoing diseases because it has very limited effects on a lot of other systems. Uh, but I would caveat, I do not like to use it in healthy cats or, or um, very anxious cats because weirdly enough, it can actually really ramp them up because of the euphoria. And so they can get really crazy and there've been cats that you give them a dose of and they just start bouncing off the wall. So it's important um, just from prior uh, experience, I do not give those to healthy cats. And with midazolam, you can give that sub-Q, IM, IV, diazepam. Most of the time, you're only gonna wanna give that IV. Um, at least that's what we primarily do. So like if you if you're have an active seizure, even if you can't get a catheter in, I would I recommend giving it IV. 
Then we have ACE promazine, um, which is a central uh, antagonist of the dopamine 2 receptor and the histamine 1 receptor. The effects that you're going to get from that is going to be uh, calming. It's a tranquilizer or a sedative. It, um, it's just going to help smooth everything out. You do get vascular relaxation, and, and the reason that's important is that that causes a lot of hypotension. So with the uh, vascular uh, relaxation or the hypotension, it's just important to kind of keep an eye on that, your blood pressure throughout the procedure. So if they have a history of heart failure or heart disease, I try to avoid that if possible. Um, and it doesn't provide any pain control, but when you mix that with opioids, um, they, it, it just works really well together and can cause um, a good combination. Uh, and then our last class is the NMDA associatives, and they work by uh, interrupting the transmission of essentially the brain to the limbic areas. And so you're still gonna have a little bit of muscle tone, you're gonna have some eye reflexes, but it provides um, good chemical restraint. But because of the muscle tone that you still have present, you're gonna have uh, really poor relaxation. So they're gonna be really rigid, almost like they're fighting the anesthesia um, if, you, if you give it alone. So that's why it's important to mix this one with um, other medications. The two main examples that we see is ketamine and telazole. Um, and telazole is a dissociative plus a benzodiazepine, and I'll explain that a little bit more uh, when we get to the induction. Um, but with the ketamine, again, I think most people are probably pretty familiar because it is widely used throughout the world. It has a wide safety margin. You can use it on almost all species of animals, which is really nice. Um, I just don't like using ketamine again alone just because of the, they tend to wake up a little bit um, overexcited. We don't have as much good muscle control. So I like to uh, mix this one, especially with like an alpha two agonist um, because you can get the injectable anesthesia with that. And I, I, I like putting it with an opioid too. So uh, just to talk about cats uh, in particular, a good combination that we use quite often is called Kitty Magic. And the reason for that is because it works really well. You know, it works effectively, quickly, and then they wake up um, pretty well. And the combination that we use with that is dexmedetomidine, eutorphanol, and ketamine. And you can take all three of those in those concentrations, and that's micrograms, not milligrams. Um, and you can take all three of those, take about a cc or 0.1 cc's to 0.2 cc's of each, mix them together and give sub-Q or IM and get some really good anesthesia for, you know, 30 minutes to 40 minutes. Sometimes I will switch out the butorphanol for buprenorphine if it's going to be a little bit more painful uh, procedure. So if it's a, um, a spay or a dental that's going to have a lot of extractions, I might switch the butorphanol out for buprenorphine. One good website that I put at the end of the PowerPoint is the, it's VASG.org, but that's the Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia Support Group. And that is great. Um, getting some uh, reverb there. But, uh, but they have some great information on pre meds, induction drugs, and, and all kinds of things. But uh, same thing, they recommend the butorphanol, the ketamine, and the um, dexmedetomidine is, is a great combination. So for induction, you know, there's there's a bunch of different ways to induce a dog. Uh, the three that I'm going to talk about mainly is propofol, telazole, and mast induction. Um, ketamine valium, or ketval, is essentially the same thing as telazole. It's a... It's a NMDA associated with um, a benzodiazepine. Um, and we have propofol too. So starting with propofol here. Sorry, I keep hearing. Okay. Um, so with propofol, 
As you can see from this picture, it's it's white. It's one of the few drugs um, that you can give IV that's white. We were always taught in school, we never give anything that's white IV. Well, propofol is one of the exceptions to that rule. It's a GABA agonist, so again, it's good if you have a history of seizures. Um, it is IV only, so you pretty much have to have a catheter when you're using it. Um, so that's probably the one disadvantage to it, but overall, in the grand scheme, it's a really good drug. Uh, we start at typically the four milligrams per kilogram, especially if they have pre-meds on board. And so we're gonna slowly give to effect. So we typically are gonna do four mg per kg, and then we're going to start at the one third dose to one half dose to let it take effect. Uh, it's important to monitor the respiratory rate, their color, their mucous membrane color, and their pulse because if um, it is pretty, it's a pretty strong drug. So I mean, it can stop their breathing um, or it can cause hypotension really rapidly uh, if you push it too aggressively. Um, and you do want to be pretty close to. Uh, intubating them and putting them on gas anesthesia once you start using it because it's really fast acting. I mean, you you slowly start pushing it, and within you know 15 to 30 seconds, their their head's going to start dropping and they're going to start feeling the effects of it. But it doesn't last very long either, so that's why it's important to go ahead and have them uh, ready to be intubated um, and hooked up to gas. But even though it's a strong and a potent drug with a narrow safety margin, it actually is really good for critical patients, patients with history of seizures. Uh, you can use it in cardiac disease, respiratory disease. Um, and then another one that's good for is, is pregnant dogs. Uh, so pregnant that need a C-section or pregnant that need a, a C-section followed by a spay. And you're worried about the effects of the drugs that you're using on the puppies. Uh, this is a good drug to use. So what we'll do, typically is, is um, shave them, shave their arm, put a catheter in with no pre-meds, and then we'll probably have to use a little bit of the higher end of the dose, uh, but then we'll induce just with the propofol, intubate them and maintain them on gas anesthesia. And once the puppies are out, that's when we'll add on the, the pain medicine, the opioid or, or uh, usually like hydromorphone. That way the puppies don't feel the effects of it. And then some people use it as a seizure control um, like if you have a dog that will just cannot stop seizing you can put them on a constant rate infusion of propofol at low doses to kind of uh, break them up at and then telazole uh, like i said i was going to get back to it's a um, it's an nmda antagonist with um, benzodiazepine we like to use it iv most of the time at about 0.1 mls per 10 pounds uh, and it works well for inducing dogs and cats. Um, now, one thing to remember is that they will maintain their gag reflex and the jaw tone. It'll be a little bit more lax than normal, but with propofol, their head is just gonna drop, okay? And then you can kind of open up their mouth. Uh, once the jaw tone is gone, you know they're ready to be intubated. Teal is all they're gonna keep their jaw tone and they'll still lick their tongue occasionally, uh, but at that, point you can go ahead and intubate them. It works really well in cats too um, to give IM or IV. I do like to mix that though with an alpha 2 or with an opioid um, but it can be really effective. I tend to see a little bit rougher recoveries though if you're giving it by itself uh, without a pre-med especially in cats. Cats can wake up really aggressive um, for the next like six to 12 hours until it wears off completely. They can be really aggressive. So you can have a really sweet cat, then you give them this, do the neuter spay, whatever. And then when they wake up, just be really careful because they can be uh, aggressive for a while. Uh, but same thing as ketamine, you just don't want to use this in dogs with cardiac disease, seizures, um, or if they're really debilitated or critical. The nice thing about telazole though, is that you do typically maintain your heart rate and your blood pressure seem to stay pretty consistent, but you can give atropine with it if you need to. Um, but all in all, it's a, it's a pretty good method to use. So moving on to induction. Kind of the last um, method that we typically use is mask induction or gassing down induction. And essentially what we're doing here is we're taking the isofluorine or sevofluorine, which I'll talk more about in the next slide, 
and um, instead of using we're not using any um, typically in this case we're not going to use any pre-meds or anything uh, or we might use a little bit of a pre-med but a lot of times it's like a fractious cat that you can't get your hands on like um, so we'll put them in a box like you see here on the picture and you can see the tube here coming in and so what we're doing is we're pumping in oxygen and ISO until that cat goes completely asleep. Um, I don't love this method though. This is typically, we're only using this for cases that are really fractious cats or um, if we need a dog to pop right back up immediately and not have a long um, waiting period. The main time that we're gonna use this, at least in the States, is um, pocket pets and exotics or birds. A lot of exotic uh, veterinarians like to use it for birds and, and pocket pets because you can see a lot more adverse effects with um, these smaller animals and birds with the pre-meds induction drugs so they typically just gas them down because uh, it works a lot quicker and easier um, but again I don't like using this method unless there's a lot of heavy pre-meds on board um, and again you are gonna have a lot more of an excited excitation phase so like when you are putting them under you'll have a longer stage two phase of the excitement phase, but also when they're coming out of it, they're gonna be in a little bit longer um, excitement phase. And so because it is stressful on them and you're having to hold them down, ideally you don't wanna use with cardiac disease. Uh, but to talk about maintenance in general, gas anesthesia, um, the two main ones that we're gonna use is isofluorine and sevofluorine. They're both GABA agonists, so they're gonna work at the spinal cord and the brain uh, to provide that anesthesia and analgesia. Um, now they are dose dependent. So you can see here, this is a uh, vaporizer. Uh, we have off zero. This is 0 0.5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this little arrow here is pointing. Right now we have this on 0 0.5. And so when you're do, performing anesthesia and you're watching their heart rate and you're listening to their lungs and watching the respiratory rate and their blood pressure, uh, if the blood pressure drops, this is one of the big ones that you want to uh, decrease to kind of help with that. Um, most of the patients that we do, if we're doing pre-meds and then we're doing induction and then we're get, maintaining on gas, most of the time with isofluorine, we can keep it at around two or less, especially if it's a non-painful procedure like a dental cleaning, uh, mild wound repair or a neuter or something like that, we can usually keep it lower. But if we're doing fracture repairs or um, splenectomies or something that's a little bit more invasive, a little bit more painful, we might have to turn them up the, uh, from time to time. But like I said, with a good anesthesia or pre-meds induction protocol, we can usually keep them a little bit lower. Sevofluorine, the, the biggest difference is it's a little bit faster acting uh, and the concentration is a little bit different. So Sevo is typically double ISO. So like if you're running two on ISO, it'll be four on SIVO. Um, but it's a pretty narrow margin. So you want to keep them as low as you can while providing good anesthesia, uh, a surgical plane of anesthesia. So if they start responding to you, to you cutting or pulling on a pedicle or whatever, you might have to turn them up from time to time. But as soon as that painful portion of the surgery is over, you want to turn them back down. Uh, but it's pretty easy to control it with the vaporizer. So since we just talked about all that, let's go through like an actual case example just to kind of put it together. So we, let's say we have a 25 kilogram dog. What we can do is pre-med them with uh, dex, that's five micrograms, and then hydromorphone um, at 0 0.1 micro, uh, milligrams. And so we're going to get about 2.24 mLs, 0.1 or 1.2 mLs. We're going to wait about 20 to 30 minutes, let that pre-med start taking effect. Then we're going to place our catheter. And then as we go into the induction phase, we're going to use propofol. Um, the low dose for this 24 kilogram dog is um, four milligrams per kilogram. And that ends up being about 9.6 mLs. Um, but we're not going to necessarily give that full 9.6 mils. We're going to start out giving it about a third of that dose, and then we're going to wait about 30 seconds or so, 15 to 30 seconds, see how much of an effect. We're going to feel for the jaw, see if it's loose. We're going to check the eye position, see if they're ventral. 
Uh, and if they're uh, under enough, then we'll go ahead and intubate. But if not, we'll push a little bit more. And if we have to give that full 9.6 ml, that's fine. Uh, but we're going to do that slowly over time while we're also monitoring their breathing and their mucous membrane color. We're then going to intubate them and hook them up to oxygen and isofluorine as the um, most common method. And then once the procedure is over, we're going to turn them off of the ISO and allow them to breathe just pure oxygen for about three to five minutes and let that all that ISO kind of flush out of their system, out of their lungs. It's primarily metabolized by the lungs, so that's why we like to give them the oxygen to let that um, uh, kind of rotate out. And then we want to see two to three swallows um, minimum before we extubate them. And then once we extubate them, we want to monitor them for the ne next little bit just to make sure that they're uh, coming around. We want to make sure they're not having any regurge uh, or any chance to aspiration. And then it's important to continue to monitor that TPR, like I said, until they're up and moving around, especially that temperature, because if the temperature is low, those drugs are going to stay in the system longer, resulting in um, a a longer recovery time and increased chances of something going wrong. And then just some special considerations to think about. So if you have a brachiocephalic like these pugs uh, or English bulldogs, French bulldogs, um, dog with cardiac disease or murmurs, seizures, or if they're older pet that you're a little bit worried about, um, kind of the method that I typically like to do is either an opiate by itself or opioid with a benzodiazepine. Um, you can give those IM or IV. If you're really worried about it, you can shave them up, uh, put a catheter in without any sedation, and then give the sedation IV. Then I'd like to pre-oxygenate them for like five to 10 minutes just to get them uh, as pink and, and uh, full of, get their um, O2 stats as high as possible, or pulse ox stats. And then we're going to give propofol to the lowest possible effect that we can. And as soon as that head drops and as soon as their jaw is, is good enough, we're going to go ahead and intubate them. And we're going to kind of maintain them on as low of, of gas as possible. Then once we're done, we're going to take, turn them off the ISO and they're going to get oxygen again for another five to 10 minutes at least. And with the, especially with the brachiocephalics, I'm not pulling that even if they swallow two or three times. We're not pulling that tube until they're fighting us almost, to, almost to where they're biting down on the tube just because uh, those are the, the number one pets that you're gonna have some of the biggest respiratory issues with after anesthesia. So it's really important that we leave that tube in for as long as we possibly can. Uh, that delayed extubation is really critical, especially with those brachiocephalics. All right, so let's jump into like kind of the next segment, which is the field anesthesia. So Dr. Dixon and Dr. Benjamin were uh, kind enough to provide me with their protocol um, that they use in a lot of their rural um, camps and then in the field. And so what they're going to do for an uh, average of a 15, 35 kilogram dog is they're going to give one ml of the 50 milligrams per uh, ml ketamine. They're going to do one ml of xylazine, the 23.3%, and then one ml of atropine sub-Q. So the ketamine is going to be given separately from the xylazine, but both are given IM, and they're going to give one ml of the atropine. They're going to wait, you know, usually within 10 to 15 minutes, that's going to be taking effect. And then once it takes effect, you have about 30 minutes of anesthesia where you can perform neuters, a quick spay, uh, laceration repairs, those kinds of things. And then Dr. Page also gave me her um, cocktail that she likes to use. So she, uh, uses butorphanol as a pre-med and that's going to be about 0.1 ml per 10 pounds or 0.1 ml per 4.5 kilogram sub-Q. Then for her induction, she's going to use, um, she actually mixes, she takes a 10 ml bottle of ketamine, which is 100 milligrams per ml, and she adds 2.5 ml of 100 milligrams per ml xylazine. And with that mixture, she uses about one ml per every 20 pounds or one ml per, per nine kilograms, and she gives that IM. And then for her reversal, she uses uh, Yohamine, and there's her dosing. Um, so small cats, a quarter of a cc, a medium dog, half a cc, large dog, one cc. And so what she does typically is gives the pre-med, which is that butorphanol. She's gonna wait about 10 minutes, and then um, she's gonna give the 
um, ketamine xylazine IM. Um, she's going to wait about five minutes, and that gives you about 20 to 35 minutes of, of anesthesia. So it's pretty similar to Dr. Um, Dixon and Dr. Benjamin's protocol. Um, she's then going to place a, a ET tube just to make sure the airway stays open during the process. Now, one thing that you know she does is she redoses it. So let's say you're in the middle of a spay and it's taking a little bit longer than you anticipated, and the dog's starting to come around. Well, you can redose that. But it's important that when you give that second dose, don't do anything for about 90 seconds. Let that take effect, and then um, you can start continuing with your procedure. Now that's really important to allow that medicine, especially the xylazine, to kick in. Um, all right there. And then moving on to um, her cat neuter protocol, which is pretty similar to our uh, kitty magic. Uh, we have the ketamine, dax and butorphanol, and her dose is about 0.15 uh, mLs per 10 pounds, or 4.5 kilograms. She mixes all those together and gives them IM. Same thing that we do. Like I said, you can give those uh, IM or sub Q, but IM is really better. Um, just because you have a little bit more profound and quicker effect. So I like to do IM for, for neuters and spays as well. All right, and then uh, moving on, we, and then you can reverse it with antecedent as well. And then some good emergency drugs to have on hand uh, is atropine, epi, and dopamine, uh, Dopram, uh, and for each one of these, these are the doses that um, Dr. Pages uses. So for atropine, that's good. You know, if the heart rate is low, um, then you can give about a, a cc for a big dog, half a cc for a medium dog, 0.25 cc's for a small dog. But that also works for the epinephrine and Dopram. Dopram is gonna help stimulate breathing. So if you have a dog that's really struggling to breathe and you're really worried about it, you can give them Dopram. Um, Serenia. Uh, it's a really great drug to stop vomiting. Uh, I'm not sure how many people have access to that drug, but I really like Dopram a lot. Uh, I mean, sorry, I like uh, Serenia a lot. Again, uh, atropine for drooling the bradycardia. Sorry, hang on. Sorry about that, that loud noise in the background there. Um, and then diazepam, um, five milligrams per ml, and then uh, you can use about one cc, you know, for a big dog and half a cc, a quarter to a half cc for smo most other dogs would be fine, um, or to effect. So if you have a calf brand, especially, just do a half cc, wait a little bit, and then give another half cc. But even if you don't, you can kind of give that one to effect. And then I think it's really important just to mention real quick about fluids, if possible. Uh, I, I really like doing IV fluids in, in animals for most procedures if they're going to last more than, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. So cat neuter, dog neuter, especially if you're out in the field, not a big deal. But when we start talking about spays, amputations, uh, fracture repairs, splenectomies, uh, things like that, I think it's really important to have fluids on board. It can help maintain your blood pressure, which is really critical to perfuse in the kidneys and all your tissues, uh, but it can help, uh, you know, keeping those fluid levels good throughout the procedure. Um, my main dosing for dogs is about five milligrams per kilogram. Cats, I use a little bit less, three milligrams per kilogram. You can do five to 10 for dogs, but I like have starting with just the five because that gives you a range and gives you some wiggle room. So like if you're becoming hypotensive, and you need to give them a little bit more fluids, you can increase that amount. Whereas if you start at 10 mils per kilogram, you don't have a whole lot of room, and I don't think it's necessary always to, to start at 10 mils. And, you know, I think it's important to note that you can fluid overload these dogs, which can lead to edema. It can lead to pulmonary dysfunction uh, and fluid overload. And so when that happens, um, you can start to see really bad adverse effects from the anesthesia. So they're going to start having breathing issues. Um, they may have, like I said, the hypotension. 
Uh, and so it's important to kind of keep a close eye on your fluids, make sure you're not giving too much. Uh, and then that gives you a buffer to protect your, your tissues, but also if you're hypotensive, you can uh, do some fluids to help with that. Uh, it is important to note that, you know, sub-Q fluids, I don't think it's a bad thing to do. Like if you can't get a catheter in and you don't have access to IV fluids, um, I don't think it's a bad thing to do sub-Qs, but the only problem with sub-Qs is because it takes so long for them to absorb, they're not really going to help with maintaining your blood pressure. And if they're not warmed, they can actually work against you because they can make the patient hypothermic or c contribute to the hypothermia. Um, which can, again, increase your complications. So if you can warm them uh, and give them afterwards, that'd be fine as long as their temperature is good. So a couple of important um, considerations, I'm just gonna hit those real quick, is hypothermia is a really big one that we worry about. So at less than 97 or 36 degrees Celsius uh, is kind of termed hypothermia. And this is when you, when they're under anesthesia, they have a suppression of the CNS and so a central nervous system. So with that, they can't shiver. They can't um, do different things to generate heat and to provide their body with some protection. And so because they have a loss of that thermoregulation, it's very common that under anesthesia, we see hypothermia. Um, severe hypothermia can actually lead to bradycardia or decreased heart rate in the the scary thing about this one is it does not respond well to atropine. So even if you have bradycardia because of the, if it's because the temperature is so low, then that it will not respond to the atropine. Um, you also get a shift of blood from the core to the peripheries uh, when they're under anesthesia. And so that gives it more surface space for them to lose heat. Uh, and it makes it harder for you to conserve that heat. Uh, and another really important thing is your metabolism decreases when you're hypothermic and there, when that happens you have a decrease in drug metabolism so it's essentially like all your drugs are stronger and last longer and more potent so you have a lot more delayed recovery times, longer effects, and more chances of adverse reflect effects. Uh, I think it's just, you know, really important just to anytime you're going to be doing a procedure, it's always easier to prevent hypothermia or to at least, um, you know, keep hypothermia at a minimum versus once that patient is hypothermic, especially if it's a long procedure and you're going to be there for a while, um, it's really important to keep their temperature normal. But be careful. This is a picture of a heating pad. Uh, a dog that was laid on a heating pad that was not monitored close enough, and this is severe burns. This is something we see uh, can happen quite commonly. So it's important that if you don't have a, if you're using like just a regular heating pad that you bought at a store versus like a, a medical heating pad to keep a really close eye on it because it can burn them really quickly and easily, especially if you shave them and there's no fur there to protect it. So it's important to keep the heat turned down and monitored closely. Um, you know, there's different methods. You can put socks on their feet. You can heat up rice in a sock. Um, you can use old IV bags and heat those up and put those around the animal. But just be, it's just important to make sure they're not too hot. A quick word about hypotension. So normal hypotension or normal blood pressure is uh, 90 to 140 systolic. Uh, and then the MAP or the mean arterial pressure is 60 to 100. I like to see it around at least 70 or 80. If we get below 70, we like to start doing some methods to start addressing that. So the number one, if you're using gas anesthesia, is just to turn that down. That is the most potent hypotensive agent that's happening to that animal. So number one, turn down the vaporizer if possible. Uh, number two, you can give a fluid bolus or increase their fluid rate and see if that helps. Three, you want to start reversing any drugs that you can. Um, so like your dexmedetomidine would be the first one or your um, xylazine, whatever your alpha-2 agonist is, that's the first thing you'd want to reverse. And then if you have vasopressins on board or available, you can use those as well. And then bradycardia is a, another one that we see quite often. Um, one of the main reasons that we see bradycardia is either drug related or they're too deep under anesthesia. So if they're too deep, again, the first thing you can do is turn down the vaporizer, give it a few minutes uh, and just see if that helps. If it's drug induced and it's 
due to dexman and tobinine, then I would recommend first do a partial, like a half reversal of the adapamazole IM. And if that doesn't fix it, then you can do a full reversal. Um, but if that's not working, that's when I'll add on the atropine at that point. Um, and again, it, it's important to remember if they're hypothermic, severely hypothermic, it may not re resolve um, with atropine. So it's important to keep an eye on that temperature the whole time. And then tachycardia, a lot of times they're gonna present with tachycardia just because they're stressed out, anxious. And so when we use those alpha-2, that can help reduce the anxiety, which can help with the tachycardia. Um, if you're actually in the procedure, they're under anesthesia and having tachycardia, it could be because the body is um, responding to a pain, painful stimulus. Um, so the plane of anesthesia might be too light. You know, so like if you're pulling on a pedicle and the heart rate skyrockets or the respiratory rate increases, then you might want to um, turn up the anesthesia. Uh, could be drug induced. So, but usually atropine is going to max out around 200. So you just need to look out for anything else. Like maybe it's, is it an arrhythmia? You know, like ventricular tachycardia can be very detrimental. So if that's the case, then you need to treat that with lidocaine. Uh, and there's a dose for lidocaine. So in summary, um, you know, I think it's really important to have a few protocols that you're really comfortable with using day in and day out. Maybe have a few variations for specific cases. Like if, you know, for most of your dogs, you might use um, xylazine, ketamine. Um, but then if you got a dog that you know has a heart issue or you know has liver issues or something along those lines, then you can use uh, um, like a diazepam or midazolam in place of one of those drugs to kind of help calm that down uh, or help get them under anesthesia but not have as much of an effect on them. And it's good to know kind of what to expect. So the more you use those drugs, you'll know what the complications are commonly with those. So the more comfortable you are with them, you know more what to expect, how to redose it, how to fix the complications that come along with it. And if you can use drugs that have reversals, that's even better because if you have a dog that's having an adverse effect, you can use that reversal to kind of help get you out of that um, trouble. And keep it straightforward and simple. So the more medications you can use that have easy dosing, you can decrease the chance of you overdosing them. Um, and again, knowing what to look for. And then the TPR is really, really important. So most, like I said, a lot of times we don't have access to a machine. Um, and if you don't, that's that's okay. We can make it work without. So, but it's important that we're, we have a good thermometer that we can use, um, have a good stethoscope so we can listen to the heart and keep a close eye on that respiratory rate. And then the most common problems, you know, are those and dyspnea or trouble breathing is another one that we see commonly. And with that, I'm usually looking kind of similar. You know, if their breathing is really low, they're only going to take one or two breaths a minute, then I'm worried about more, are they too deep? So do we need to turn down the vaporizer, look to maybe reverse some drugs? If they're panting or really huffy throughout the whole thing, okay, are they too light? Maybe we need to increase the um, anesthesia a little bit. Um, I just wanted to wrap it up because I'm getting close to my time there. Uh, here's some really good resources. Like I said, I would recommend visiting the VASG.org. Um, they have some really good information there. Um, AAFP has some good anesthesia guidelines for cats. And then AHA also has some good anesthesia and monitoring guidelines for both cats and dogs. So now I will take on your questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to talk a little bit fast there at the end. I just wanted to make sure I got through all the information. Yeah, this is the time for us. You can ask any questions. Either you can unmute yourself and you can ask directly Dr. Mark or you don't want to ask directly, you can put it in the chat box and he will answer it. So just another 10 minutes will be over. So kindly stay till the end. This is a time for question and answer. I have a question. Yes. 
much, Amak. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. And, uh, it reminded me that I've forgotten so much <laughs> about what I studied. <laughs> um, my question is just about the induction uh, with Propofol. Uh, you mentioned uh, to do it um, in uh, stage-wise. Um, so do you give that like one third of it as a bolus or is that uh, done slowly as well? Yeah, great question. So typically I do want to push that kind of slow and I would say not over, you know, two or three minutes, but I'm talking about, you know, when I'm pushing it, I'm kind of pushing it at you know, just a slow push. And I'm going to push about a third of that at a slow push. And then once I get to that one third, I'm just going to sit there for about 15 to 20 seconds and just watch the animal. And if they start dropping and falling out, then I'm going to wait, check their jaw tone, make sure the jaw tone, because really with propofol, they should have almost no jaw tone whatsoever. So once you push it and it hits them and their head drops, I'm going to fill the jaw tone. I'm going to look at their eye position. Their eyes should be kind of rotated down medial and then the jaw tone should be almost gone. <laughs> you should be able to easily pull their tongue out and put a tube in. But if they're fighting you at all, then go ahead and push some more. Thank you. Oh, welcome Dr. Muniswar from Canada. Yeah, it's a time for question and answer. Any more questions or any more clarification you want to Dr. Mark to explain it again, he will be happy to do that. I have a question for you, sir. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, like uh, you have mentioned here commonly in the field, what we do is to maintain the uh, to maintain the anesthesia, we normally go in for in, uh, injectable anesthetics in places where we do not have uh, gas anesthesia. So, what would uh, what would be your advice regarding that? Like, what have you have you practiced or have you done that? Or what would you be your advice as to the best maintenance the medicine medication that we can give for maintenance? I would say. Um... I like using, I've used Dr. Page's protocol on space. Uh, and we had, uh, we were at a, uh, doing some field anesthesia at a uh, American uh, reservation. And so we were doing a lot of German Shepherd space, big, quite big dogs that take a little bit longer than your typical, you know, older German Shepherds, so a little bit longer than your typical. So I like the fact that you can redose that. And so typically what we'll do is do IM to start with. And then when you redose it, a lot of times you can give that IV, um, and I'll clarify that with Dr. Page, but um, a lot of times you can just redose that, wait 90 seconds, and then that gives you another, you know, 20 minutes or so to, to keep working. And I really like that because you don't have to worry about, like you said, having access to gas anesthesia, but you can still, because like, if you only have one dose and you only have 20 or 30 minutes and that's it, and when you get to that 30 minutes, you're you're in a tough spot, but being able to redose it, I really like using that um, because it gives you a little bit of protection. Okay, have you, I mean, uh, what is your opinion if, or have you used or heard about, we, here we do, we use ketamine and diazepam together or ketamine with metazolam, uh, the benzodiazepines, we combine them, mix them in a one, one is to one ratio by volume and uh, we use that as a maintenance uh, anesthetic protocol uh, but then in very rare cases we may have to redose with the xylosin combination i mean have you used that or have you do you have any comments on that that would be better i personally have not used that um dr page probably would have a little bit more um, experience with using those um, I can say that, like I said, the telazole is probably the one I have the most experience with, um, but we typically don't use, I'll use that for like a cat neuter. So if I've got a cat neuter, I'll inject that IM, and that's enough usually just to, to take care of the cat neuter. And you could use it for a cat spay too, um, but for like a dog spay, I would probably stick with the, the ketamine xylazine combination. 
um, and just redose that as needed. Like I said, if you if you're taking a little bit longer. We do it with the ketamine xylosin combination for induction and then for maintenance we go in for ketamine benzodiazepine uh, combination. And so do you, are you doing that as a like a constant rate infusion or are you just re-dosing re it? I, we redose it actually. We okay. redose it. Each animal gets it a slightly different in each animal. Sometimes we will be re We mix it at a one is to one ratio. One is to one of ketamine with the diazepam or with midazolam, and then redose it. Sometimes the dog may get 0.4 of the mixture IV continuously. Sometimes it'll be 0.5. It depends on the animal. So okay. the, what I feel good about it is after the surgery is over, within maybe five to ten minutes, the animal is up. Okay. That is, the yeah, the and so you like that much faster. Then redosing with xylus and ketamine again. Okay, yeah, and that makes sense because um, yeah, with that xylosine, it can really knock them out. So um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a good protocol to me, just because diazepam, like you said, it, it works well, but it's not near as potent on them, especially on the cardiovascular system. So I would probably feel, I feel like that's probably yeah, a good method to use. Thought I would. I mean, I just wanted to know your comments as well as I thought I would share. That's what we do practice. I mean, in places I do practice it because we. I don't have access to gas anesthesia now. Thank you. Sir. Absolutely.